Hello everybody. This is the Introduction to Simulation module, and in this module we will, not surprisingly, introduce the idea of simulation. We will provide some definitions, some key term definitions, a few examples, and then we'll move into the idea of randomness in simulation and give a brief introduction to how we model that randomness. Uh, we'll talk about the basic components of a simulation study, and finally we'll end with some success tips, that, success tips that will help you become a better uh, simulationist. Before we get started, I want to provide the references for the material that I use to put this lecture together. Uh, you can see that I've divided the references into two categories. There are the set of package, simulation package, language specific references, and these tend to focus on simulation from the perspective of a, of a specific simulation package. And then there's the general references where they focus much more on the topic of simulation in general. And so there's package agnostic, if you want to think about it that way, uh, that would apply, have application across a broad variety of simulation packages. So I've picked out some uh, formal definitions of simulation, and I'm not going to read these to you, so you, can, you should pause the video for a few minutes and read these, and then come back, and then I'll discuss some of the basic topics. So hopefully you read the definitions, and so if you did, the critical terms that we have in all of these definitions are model, system, and experiment. So in simulation, we're creating a model, in this case a computer model. Generally, we're creating a model of a system, and often a complex system where entities interact uh, in a complex way. And so once we have that model, we use an experimentation process, create experiments so that we can analyze the underlying system that we've created the model for. Let's look at our first example. This is what's called a tandem queuing system. So you can see I have two servers here. And I'm going to make this a little bit uh, clearer, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to relate this to a Subway restaurant. Hopefully you guys have all been to a Subway, subway restaurant, or at least you know how they work. Uh, and so basically when we think about how the server works, you can think of the server one as the person who makes your sandwich, and server two as the person who either gets your drink or, or takes your money and that kind of stuff. And so when customers arrive, they go to server one, and then they go to server two, and then they go, you know, enjoy their food. Uh, but there's queuing where when you walk in, you might have to wait if someone else is being served. And then once your sandwich is made, you might also have to wait if the person uh, is taking money from, from another customer. And so we have a basic simulation model here of that tandem queuing system. So you can see I've modeled my two servers, and I've modeled the uh, people, in this case the customers that are arriving, going to server one and server two. We have the queuing and so on. And at the, uh, as the simulation runs, we're tracking, in this case, two statistics uh, with respect to the system. I'm tracking the gold line, which is the instantaneous number of customers in the system and the green line, which is the running average number of customers in the system. And so, of course, in the simulation, I would be tracking many more statistics, much more information about, uh, the, about, the, uh, about the system that we're modeling. But the key thing here is that what I've done is I've created an abstraction of my Subway restaurant into my uh, tandem queuing model. The second example that I'm going to show is of a system that's a little bit more complex than our simple queuing system, our simple tandem queuing system. So you can see I have a small airport here where I have customers that are arriving to the system. They're going to a queue, and then from that queue they're going to a um, uh, check-in process, so they're going to get their, their ticketing. Uh, and they can either go to a live ticketing agent or they can go to one of the, the, uh, the uh, self-serve ticketing uh, agents. Then they go through a, you can think of this as TSA, where you're going and having your, your ID checked and so on. They go from here to security screening, and then from security sc screening to the gate where they board their flight and leave. So this is the similar system in that we have uh, different queues and we have customers and so on, but it's quite a bit more complex than our simple tandem queuing system. And for a system like this, uh, we would want to use our simulation model to make decisions such as, you know, staffing. Should I have people, you know, at the check-in or should I have them in security? Uh, should I have more self-check-ins or more uh, customer service agents? Uh, you can use physical layout so I can look at this and say, okay, well, how should I have my uh, waiting area set up and so on? So again, you can see uh, we also have this nice 3D animation so that you can um, both 
verify that the model works as expected, but also um, uh, demonstrate its behavior. And you can also see here now that we are uh, behind the scenes, uh, behind the animation, we're also tracking quite a bit of uh, numerical information and performance metrics about our system. And so we would use that information to uh, analyze the, uh, the, um, the, in this case, the airport operation. In our third example, I don't have a model. I'm not going to focus on the simulation model, but I'm going to focus on a situation where we would use a simulation model and how we would use that simulation model to analyze the system. And so what this is, is this is uh, an example of the Simio student competition where a realistic problem is presented and student teams compete to uh, solve that problem. So I'm not going to read this to you. I'm going to, you should pause the, simu or pause the video uh, and read it uh, and then come back and then uh, continue and then we'll discuss. There's also a page two, so let me go to the page two. Again, you can go back and forth on the video and make sure that you've um, read the assignment or the basics of the assignment and then come back. Okay, so let's discuss what's going on here. And so this is a proposed car rental facility. And so we have a rental center and we have an airport. So this would be located at an airport. Uh, and the innovation here is that you can either rent a vehicle or let someone else rent your vehicle. So you're providing a service for uh, me as an owner to connect with you as someone who wants to rent your car. Uh, and so when you think about how this works, I've got a rental center and I've got the airport. And then I have departing passengers from the rental center. I have two categories. I have owners where I'm leaving my vehicle to go fly somewhere. Or I have renters that are uh, returning the vehicle and need to uh, take the shuttle bus to the airport. Similarly, from the airport to the rental center, I also have those same two categories. I have owners that are picking up their vehicle, so they return from their flight, or from their trip, and they're picking up their vehicle. And I also have renters who are just arriving and need to rent a vehicle. And as I mentioned, we have a shuttle uh, that transports passengers between uh, the airport and the rental center. And so this is the basic of the system. And what we're trying to decide is several different interrelated decisions. The, the, the fundamental decision that we're trying to make is, should we do this? Is this a cost-effective or is this a, a money-making proposition? The decisions that will help us do that, we need to think about layout, how big does the rental center need to be, uh, and uh, you know, where should it be located relative to the airport. We need to think about the lot capacity. You know, I have to park cars and parking takes up a lot of space, so I've got to decide how much space I want to allocate to parking cars. Staffing, how many people do I have working at the rental center versus the shuttle? Uh, the shuttle operation, uh, is it a continuous loop? Does it wait until it's full to transfer? How many shuttles do I have? So I have all that kind of decision in terms of the operation. And then finally, pricing. So what do I need to price this, uh, price the services at to make this uh, competitive? So we think about creating a simulation model to answer these basic uh, questions. Another thing I want to talk a little bit about here is the two different roles that uh, come into play when we're doing simulation modeling. You have what I call the analyst role, where you are creating the simulation model and doing the actual analysis. Then you have the decision maker role, where you are consuming the analysis and then making an ultimate decision. A lot of times this is the same person, and a lot of times, it's not the same person. So sometimes you are just the analyst, and your goal is just to provide the numerical analysis. Uh, in other cases, you are just the decision maker, and someone else is doing the modeling. And then, again, as I said, uh, sometimes that um, you're both. You're doing the uh, analysis, and you're doing the decision making. But even in that case, there are two distinct roles uh, for doing the analysis and then making the decision. So the bottom line here, the reason I showed this is, in doing simulation modeling, we're not the, the goal is never to just build an animated computer model. What we want to do is learn about the system or the proposed system. So in the case of innovative car rentals, it doesn't exist. So we are proposing a system. We want to use what we learn to make decisions. Those decisions can be design decisions. They can be operation decisions. They can be just an evaluation, as in, in this case, should we do this or should we not do this? So thinking about the three systems that we've just seen, so we saw the tandem queuing, the subway model, we saw the airport model, 
And then we saw the innovative car rental. We didn't actually see the model. We saw the, the, um, uh, the problem there, though. But we think about these three systems, and we want to study those systems. And the question becomes, how can we do that? So what are the methods to study these types of systems? We basically have two uh, options here. You can either experiment with the actual system, or I can experiment with the model of the system. So you can think about my subway case. If I'm the owner of the subway, I can experiment with different staffing allocations and different task allocations, different queue configurations, so on, in my real uh, subway. Uh, in the airport, I could shift people around and do experimentation with the actual system. A lot of times that's inconvenient or impractical. And so what I'd rather do is I'd rather use a model where the model mimics the behavior of the system and then I can use that model uh, to analyze the system. With these models, we then have a further categorization of either physical models or mathematical models. So you can think of a physical model. Or, uh, physical models are commonly used for, in, you think about a uh, wind tunnel where you're evaluating uh, airplane designs or defense department designs, missiles, or things like that, where I want to check the, the, uh, the uh, flight characteristics. Uh, and so I create a physical model. You also see this a lot in architecture, where I'm creating physical model of a building or a neighborhood so that you can, in a sense, walk around and see uh, what's going on. The second category is uh, the category of mathematical models, where I don't have a physical model, but I have a representation, either expressions or a, a computer model in our case. In the mathematical model, we can, again, further subdivide into the analytical solutions where I have a set of equations and I think about solving those equations or approximating those equations or something like that. And then I have the category of simulation, which is where our interest is. And in simulation model, what I'm doing is I'm creating a mathematical representation that mimics the behavior of the actual system. So it actually behaves as the actual system behaves and then I exercise that model uh, in order to uh, make decisions about the, and do analysis and so on about the underlying system. Here we have a sampling of the areas uh, of application where simulation has been demonstrated uh, to be an effective tool. I'm not going to read all of these to you, but again, pause the video, uh, read all of these, and then come back, and then we'll uh, discuss the common themes here. So the common themes that we see across all of these categories, uh, generally we're dealing with complex systems. So we're not dealing with simple systems be, that we might be able to analyze in analytical mo models, but we have things that are much more complex. We generally have interacting entities. So think about people, customers, workers, uh, then think about parts and vehicles, and all of these things interact uh, with one another in the operation of the system. We generally have capacitated resources, or we often have capacitated resources. You can think about machines that process parts or servers that serve customers, as in our subway system, for example. Uh, we can have roads and phone lines and things like that where the entities compete for allocation. So again, if you think about back to our subway system, why do you ever wait in line? Well, when you walk in, if the server is helping another customer, then the, the, that capacitated resource is causing you to wait. Uh, randomness is also an important factor. So components in typical systems behave in stochastic manners. And so I want to focus a little bit more on this notion of randomness and simulation. So think about, I have another little model here, so let's start that. This is a, a model of a food truck. And when we think about it, as we watch that, there are many real-life phenomena that are random. And so I just have a list here of things that are seemingly random. So service times, process times, inter arrival times, waiting times, queue lengths, and so on. All in a real system, especially when we abstract this system, appear to behave uh, randomly. So if you think about the simple food truck model that I have here, you think about things like customer arrival times, the party size, how many people are coming together, uh, the order item, so what do people order? Service time, how long does it take to put an order together? Payment type, am I paying by cash? Am I paying by card? Am I paying by phone? Uh, the waiting time, so if I want to go order food, how long am I going to have to wait? Uh, food quality, uh, so some days it's better than other days, and so that, think about that as a random variable. Uh, the number of customers in line when I walk up, how many people are in front of me? 
the weather. So certainly the weather would impact uh, customer arrivals. So in this simple simulation of a food truck, in the more general case of all simulation, we have many, many different um, uh, random components that characterize system behavior and impact system performance. So in terms of how we deal with this randomness, we're interested in something called a random variable. At the most basic, a random variable is a function whose value is determined by the outcome of an experiment. That is, we don't know what the value is until after we perform the experiment. Now, we're interested in uh, understanding uh, random variables, how they work, and so on. It's fundamental to simulation analysis. And so we have two different classes of random variables. We have discrete random variables and continuous random variables. And you can see I've got some, some formal definitions of those. For our class, we're not interested really in the theoretical side. We're interested primarily in the practical applied side. But we have to have a little bit of understanding of the uh, theoretical aspects also. So think about uh, some colloquial examples here. And so think about driving to work. If you think about uh, your daily commute, uh, how long does it take? Uh, in almost all cases, it's going to take a different amount of time every day. And you don't know how long it's going to take on a particular day until actually you do it. So that's what we mean by the outcome is determined by uh, an experiment. Uh, how many cars are you going to see on the way? How many red lights are you going to hit? And so on. If you also think about something like going to Chipotle for lunch, we have a Chipotle across the street from my office. So if I want to go there for lunch, uh, I don't know how many people are going to be in line in front of me. I don't know how long it's going to take the person to take my order. I don't know how long it's going to take me to pay. How long is it going to take me to eat? And so all of those are examples, colloquial examples of random variables uh, that we uh, need to be able to deal with in a simulation model. We generally characterize random variables as either input random variables or output random variables. So the input random variables are things that are exogenous to your simulation, such as our food truck, we have customer arrival. So I have no control over the customer arrival process. So that would be an input to my model. And then we have outputs that are determined by executing the model. So we think, how long is someone gonna wait in line? Well, that's impacted by how many people are in line, uh, it's determined by executing the simulation model. So we have, again, these two basic categories of uh, random variables that we deal with from a simulation perspective. So I want to think about one in particular that we can focus a little bit on. Uh, and let's think about patient treatment times at a clinic. This is from, from our, our textbook. And so you can see I have two different figures. I have the sample um, uh, uh, PDF and sample CDF, empirical, so I have a probability a density function and empirical a cumulative distribution function for my uh, patient times. So if you think about the characterization of a random variable, this is how we do it. We characterize in terms of the density function uh, or the distribution function uh, of that random variable. Now, in general, we're interested in characteristics of those random variables. So the reason that I want to determine what the random variables are, either from an input side or an output side, is so that I can use those characteristics. So some of the characteristics that we deal with are the expected value, and I've shown here the, re the representation for both discrete and continuous. We're also interested in variance, and we're interested in quantiles, percentiles, and we will talk about all of these things uh, throughout the course. In a simulation context, we're almost always interested in samples of random variables. So while I have, in the real world, I have an, a random variable, a mathematical representation of a random variable, from the simulation perspective, I have a sample. So I'm going to have a finite sample size. And so I need to talk about, or from a uh, random variable perspective, be able to deal with samples in determining, predicting values uh, of the uh, underlying random variable. So going back to our notion of input analysis and output ana or input random variables and output random variables, for these input random variables, I need to understand them so that I can create a computer model to generate observations. Again, think back to our food truck, I have customer arrivals. I need to understand the customer arrival process so that I can use the computer model to generate observations. 
On the output random variable size, I need to be able to characterize, use observations of those random variables, and then characterize that behavior so that I can predict things like what's the expected time to go to work. While I might not know the actual time that it takes me to get to work today, I should have some idea of that expected value, and then I might also have an idea uh, of the variance of that uh, time. And so that understanding of the uh, expected value or the variance or percentiles gives me quite a bit of information, even though I don't know the actual value of the time that it's going to take me to get to work. As I said, we'll talk much more about random variables on both the input and output side as uh, we move through the course. So the basic simulation process uh, consists of these uh, four steps. We have something called conceptual design, where I'm understanding the system and trying to decide on the abstraction and so on, and I'm sort of mapping that to my simulation. Uh, I have input analysis, where I'm trying to understand the input components of the model. So again, back to our food truck example, I'm going to observe customer arrivals, and from that, from those observations, I'm trying to characterize the random variables and then create a computer model of that. We have model development, verification, and validation. So development is the actual model building process, whether you're using a simulation package like Simio or coding it in a general purpose language like Java uh, or C Sharp. Uh, it's the actual coding of the model. Verification and validation are both metrics or, or, or processes for determining correctness of the model. And so verification ensures that the model behaves like you think it does. And validation ensures that the model behaves uh, in a manner similar to the system that you're modeling. And finally, we have output analysis and experimentation. So output analysis is where I'm taking the stream of values that the simulation generates and analyzing those to determine, for example, characteristics of the random variable waiting time uh, or something like that. And then finally, experimentation, where I take my computer model and I do design and execute formal experiments so that I can make statistically valid statements uh, about the, the system that I'm modeling. So I want to say, for example, if I hire another person to, um, uh, to work, what's going to be the impact on the overall system performance? I need to be able to uh, make statistically valid statements uh, about that performance. So uh, the next thing I want to discuss briefly, and this one I do want to read to you because it's important. Uh, this is a quote from the law textbook, and it says, Users often have the unfortunate impression that simulation is just an exercise in programming. As a result, simulation studies begin with conceptual model development and subsequent programming and end with a single run of the program to produce the answers. However, simulation is actually a computer-based statistical sampling experiment. Thus, if the results are to have any meaning, appropriate statistical techniques must be used to design and analyze the simulation experiment. And so think about this definition or think about the, this statement. What do we mean by statistical sampling experiment? In a statistical sampling experiment, I have a population and I would like to understand or I would like to uh, estimate characteristics of that population by drawing a sample and analyzing the sample. So think about our food truck example and suppose what I wanted to know is the average waiting time for a customer. And so what I do is I go out and watch for a day. So I stand there for a day and I measure everyone's waiting time and then I compute the numerical average. So if we think about that, that is just one observation. So I have observed for one day, but what about the next day and the next day and the previous day and the next day and so on? And so you're almost certainly going to have different customer arrivals on different days. The weather might be different. The day of the week might be different. You just have normal variation uh, in the customer arrival process. And as a result, the average waiting time will also be different. So the notion here is that I can't draw conclusions from a single day of observation. The same thing is true when I do a simulation model. If I simulated the uh, food truck and ran it for a single day, I would have that same problem. So what the uh, statement here from law means, basically, is that you have to understand that. And if you want to make valid statements about the population, you have to do 
an appropriate, statistically valid experiment in order to be able to make those statements. And that is the important uh, fact here. So it's not just create a simulation model and do one run and have the answer. You have to have a statistically valid experiment. And through this course, we will talk a lot about what that means and how to do it, how to decide what a statistically valid experiment is. Next, we're going to spend a few minutes talking about simulation success skills. In other words, what do I need to do to be successful in carrying out simulation projects? So the first one talks about setting of objectives. And we're going to use a case study here. It's not a real case study, but it's more or less an amalgamation of several different uh, experiences that we've had. So let's say that you're asked to model a manufacturing facility at a large corporation and evaluate whether the purchase of a new $4 million crane will uh, provide the desired results. So the re desired results in this case are increased product throughput, decreased waiting time, reduction in maintenance, and etc. And so here are some uh, possible stakeholders and what their objectives might be in a typical simulation. So as before, I'm not going to read this all to you, but you should pause the, the video uh, and make sure you read these and then uh, come back and we'll discuss. And so clearly what we see is that different stakeholders are going to have different ideas of what needs to be done. So in this case, the manager of industrial engineering, your boss, wants it to be a good project, wants it to look good, wants to market their uh, the group's uh, capabilities. The materials laborer, on the other hand, is afraid that if you get the crane, they're going to lose their job. So they don't want the crane. And so when you think about uh, having a successful project, the first thing you have to understand is who are the stakeholders and what are the specific objectives of your uh, modeling exercise. So when you think about determining the objective, you need to ask questions like, what do you want to evaluate? What do you hope to prove? What's the model scope? How much detail is anticipated for each component of the model that you're building? What components are critical? which less importance might be approximated or abstracted or ignored completely. What information can be made available? What do you know? How good is the information? Who provides the information and when will the information be provided? How much experimentation is required? Do you need optimal seeking? In other words, do I need to find the true optimal solution or can I use a heuristic optimization? How will animation be used? You think about animation for model validation can be quite different than a 3D animation that you're going to use to present to the board of directors. And so knowing up front what you want uh, is beneficial. What form do you want the results? So do you want a verbal presentation? Do you want detailed numbers in a spreadsheet or database? Do you want summaries? Do you want graphs? Do you want a text report? Do you want all of these things? Understanding what's required is going to allow you to plan sufficiently in order to uh, increase the probability of a successful project. As part of the planning process, it's also important to develop something called a functional specification uh, that you and the stakeholder uh, who is commissioning the work agree to. So this is a document that's describing exactly what will be delivered, when, how, and by whom. So, the sample that structure for this document that we provide here uh, is uh, as follows. We have an introduction, which we include the simulation objectives. So again, the specific objectives that we're trying to achieve. Identification of the stakeholder. So who are we reporting to and who has to be satisfied with the results? A system description and modeling approach. So the equipment that, you will, that you're modeling, the different product types, the operations, transportation, and all of the components that are incorporated into the model. Available input data. So what do we have? What, what ob observed values do we have versus what will we approximate and so on? Output data. So what are the expectations? What uh, uh, will be generated by the simulation? Finally, project deliverables. Uh, documentation, software and training, animation, and so on. So what, are the, what will actually be handed off in the, um, uh, once the project is finished? And then planning uh, project phases, so what are the, the sequence of tasks that will be done and, and milestones and so on. Uh, and then finally sign off the agreement that the project is complete. So there are other 
uh, you don't need to be locked into this specific structure, but the important part is to have a document where the stakeholders and the simulation people, simulation team, agrees on what's going to be done, what's available, uh, and, um, uh, and so on. And so the general steps in a simulation study then are as follows. You first define the high-level objectives and identify the key stakeholders. Define the functional specification, and this is the document that we just talked about, detailed goals, model boundaries, level of detail, and so on. Uh, build a prototype uh, model. Update steps one and two as necessary, so based on what you're seeing in the prototype, you might have to update the objectives or the, the functional specification bit, um, uh, in some measure. Uh, step four, model or enhance a high-priority piece of the system, document it and verify it, and then iterate. So this is an important concept in building complex simula or building simulation models of complex systems is that we follow an iterative process, successively adding more detail to the model. Uh, collect and incorporate model input data, verify and validate the model, involve the stakeholders in this process so that everyone is in agreement that the model is correct. Uh, as part of this verification validation, you might have to return to step four if you decide that it's not valid or you have left out key components. Uh, design the experiments, so make production runs. So you have an experimental design, you then run your simulation according to that experimental design. Uh, and again, you involve the stakeholders in this uh, experimental design so that everyone's in agreement uh, when the results are reported. You might have to return to step four again, depending on what the results of the, of the runs are. Uh, finally, uh, document the results and then present the results and receive your, your kudos. So this is, again, a typical steps that you would follow in doing an actual uh, simulation uh, model or simulation project. And the last thing I'll leave you with in the introductory model is a um, um, description of the Winter Simulation Conference uh, uh, archive. And so the reason I bring this up is because in the course, we're going to use a number of the case studies that you will find here. So you can see I'm at the, the webpage informs-sim.org, which is the Winter Simulation Conference archive for every year. So for example, if I go to the most recent year from when I made this video, which was 2020, and I can go and say, let's look at commercial case studies. You have a series of uh, presentations and papers that deal with commercial application of simulation. And so these are some of the uh, papers that we're going to use throughout this course uh, to describe um, uh, applications of simulation in the uh, real world. And so that concludes this video, our basic introduction to simulation.